Uh, hi, so my name is Pekka. Uh, I come from a company called ISI. Uh, we are a space tech and information services company uh, with around 100 people uh, from Finland. Uh, the uh, snow has just melted uh, and uh, summer has come to Finland, so now we get to travel out uh, and, uh, and have to get back there before the snow gets back in, so we lock ourselves back to the office and, and get on working. Um, so a few words about the company itself. Um, I think we're a good example of a company that works in a lot of these fields that goes into the, the, the Mars uh, acronym over here. Uh, we got started with like a super simple business problem uh, where we wanted the, the uh, ships shipping in the, in the Arctic waters not to sink. And, uh, and then that was something that would have required a lot of uh, information around the ice conditions around the, around the shipping on a very rapid basis. And then we sort of hoped and thought that, or let's say, it was just supposed to be a machine learning problem or a computer vision problem. Then, then it you know, very rapidly turned out that, that, that you know, such an infrastructure uh, doesn't exist uh, for, for having you know, frequent enough uh, imagery in, in that area. And then it also turned out that, that even such sensors don't exist where, where uh, we could even build such an infrastructure. So we, uh, you know, roughly five years back, uh, you know, fell all the way down in the levels of abstraction to become you know, very you know, deep, not just space, but sort of sensors tech company. And uh, we have been you know, working ourselves uh, slowly up the chain. And uh, now we are starting to dabble in the field of machine learning again. So, so, uh, so, so that's, that's, that's the story on the background. Um, and uh, according to the title, I'm going to try to sort of scratch the surface of quite a lot of topics over here. Uh, I'm wondering, like, how big part of the audience is, you know, developers? Uh, all right, so a good, good, good half. So uh, probably roughly towards the end of it, uh, it is going to be a bit more developer content and uh, the beginning a bit more of a paradigms and, and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so we're going to be looking at a, a bit, you know, what is all of this new space and then going to specifically around the sort of type of sensors and satellites that we are operating, how uh, AI in, in earth observation or, or imaging uh, in, in generally right now uh, is working and where it's going, a few examples of locations where, you know, we are specifically working on ourselves and, you know, breaking new ground in, in terms of business and, uh, and then looking into some architectural choices of how a structure kind of like around the sort of data pipeline, and then you're working with uh, devices such as satellites in space and all the rest of the infrastructure required to it, is this, is this gonna work in the future? And, uh, and then a, a few sort of uh, pointers uh, if, if you wanna get into working with space data yourself and how to get started on that. Um, all right, so um, very first about the, you know, the, the, the paradigms. So, so um, it's fair to say that now Finally, the sort of private space age uh, is, is, is arriving. So here in the graph, you can see uh, different, uh, the different colors are, if you don't see the labels, uh, there's uh, the governmental uh, satellites being launched in, you know, since uh, 1960s in the very left, and uh, you know, roughly today is on, on the very right. So uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of governmental launches being mainly US and, and Russian governmental, uh, either military or civilian, and then the blue line there on the top is, is uh, a private, privately financed and privately built, privately launched uh, satellites, where the first spike you see there in around 1997, late 90s, where the first wave of uh, SATCOM uh, came around. And, uh, and uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the famous uh, question of technology sometimes being a bit too early. All of those companies went bankrupt once, at least. Uh, but nowadays, uh, you know, even, even those companies like Iridium, they have been, you know, saved and, and uh, actually are operating again. But now, then the sort of second uptick of, of private space launches is is really, you know, kicking uh, very well, and and it's it's only going to get much much quicker from here. So if we believe uh, all these communications mega constellation stories, uh, next ten years there's going to be orders of magnitude increase in the amount of privately launched satellites, and then certainly not at all the same amount of, of governmental. So, so really the switch sort of finally, uh, I think you know, this is a curve that you tend to see in all kinds of technology disruptions. I think you know, the, the disruption around uh, privately operated spacecraft and, and space infrastructure is, is just about to be here. So we are talking about numbers of tens of thousands of satellites being launched you know, just over the next 10 years. Um, and why is happening now? 
uh, why it didn't happen before. Uh, it's roughly three uh, key, uh, key, key topics that, that we think that has to do with it. You know, firstly, it's about you know, really the Moore's law of, of, of miniaturization of, of, of technology in a way that like, uh, we are seeing computing capability just increasing due to completely other things than space. Like, these components that we are using now, they were not built for a spacecraft. They were built for laptops or mobile phones or cars. Uh, but we're getting to then take benefit of, of, of that miniaturization and computing uh, capability increase and battery, battery capacity increase. And everything, when you can push it to, uh, to a very small space, it's going to be very efficient to launch to uh, space uh, since the mass is really the, the one thing that, that costs money in, in, in this business. And uh, the second thing is you know, really just about the access to space. So um, now a company like ours can go out there to the market, pay a few millions, and then you know, get our satellite launched on a predictable price, predictable schedule. So something that you can think of, um, let's say, on a sort of venture capital terms, like a Series A company can get their own satellite launched, completely relevant, full commercially uh, working technology into space. So kind of like the MVP uh, for, for a space tech company is now something that is uh, possible to be done uh, on a sort of a uh, you know, few millions of investment, which really shifts the, the, the barrier uh, for, for a lot of teams to get started. And, and then that's going to mean that some of the teams are going to be very successful. Um, and number three, uh, now that there already is a lot of satellites uh, and you know, launching more, launching more is going to generate more data. And then now that data is going to be completely worthless if it's just going to mean that more data is, is more working hours for a human analyst for, for that information. It's, it's, it's much more a question of now when you can use this entire stack com of computer vision machine learning, uh, you know, both for the, the sort of objects and segments, but also the pattern, patterns from those time series, uh, it's becoming something that, that you can finally sort of extract all of that value out of that high revisit, uh, uh, high revisit imaging for instance, so that this creates a sort of virtuous cycle where, where you get, uh, get you know, more data producing better models and, and, and then you know, better models actually you know, being generating more demand for, for, uh, for, for more data. Um, and then with these topics in mind, uh, if there already is, um, is, is, is a lot of satellites in space, uh, why did we, ISAV, you know, decide that we will want to make even more? Um, it really all comes down to frequency. So, so um, right now, if you put a single satellite in space, uh, you're going to be able to revisit a single site on Earth at maximum every 24 hours. And, uh, and then, every, you know, beyond that, it's, it's sort of orbital dynamics, and it can be worse or better, uh, or actually just worse. Uh, depends a bit how you want to build the coverage. But, but basically, in most modern applications, you're thinking about, you know, real time. Like, if you want to build a real um, application on top of imaging from space, uh, you know, nowadays users are used to like, having, let's say, GPS access at all times. It, 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 at least it cannot be a question of you know, whether it's cloudy or, 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 uh, or whether it's night. You have to have the availability all times. And also, you have to have it you know, literally all times that it's not good enough if you have you know, you know, your location, let's say, every once per day or something like this. So, so really, uh, well, well, what we're trying to say is, is that, that you know, the breakthrough of, um, of commercial imaging from space and then all the, all, all the sort of like the, the uh, industry-wide penetration of, of, of this technology being used kind of without any other backups, you know, really needs, needs, needs you know, massive increases in frequency. So we're talking about really at least every hour, you know, being able to have image at all times and then build applications on top of that. Um, and, um, and there is a technology that can allow us to do that in a way that um, if you want to image every hour, you know, then half of those hours at least are going to be in dark night times. Uh, so, so that's at least the limitation that you can't use a camera to take images at all times. And then also, majority of the world uh, is, is also cloudy very often. So, so uh, you also can't use really a camera to provide this sort of, you know, uh, reliable service uh, based, based on optical imaging. So uh, you use radar, and uh, 
and uh, specifically something called synthetic aperture radar, which is an existing, uh, has existed as sort of military technology for, for quite a while. But what we have done is, is, uh, is, is develop that sensor into being something kind of like along those, uh, 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 along the previous paradigms, you know, being something based on completely new, modern, small electronics so that we can, we, we can put it in a sort of commercially feasible package and then operate it on, uh, as a sort of private spacecraft instead of, instead of a governmental one. And, uh, and ultimately, the frequency comes down to just sheer amounts. This is why you see the uh, communications mega constellations also having tens of thousands of satellites is because you just can't be everywhere at once with a single satellite. You have to have a lot of satellites to be everywhere at once. In our case, we are not necessarily intending to put tens of thousands. Actually, just tens of satellites already gets us to a point where we can cover every place on the globe on, a, on, on rates of, uh, of a few hours uh, revisit. And uh, this is a great start to get, uh, get the sort of first infrastructure in, in place for rebuilding this sort of GPS, but for everything else than you know, just your own cell phone uh, type of an infrastructure uh, that you can put those applications on. And uh, this is something that we have gotten into a, a good start. Uh, we have uh, our first three satellites uh, flying. And, uh, and really showcasing that the technology in the size, uh, performance, cost scale is, uh, is, is, is good enough uh, for us to launch the service. And right now we are scaling up to, to, get, to uh, get, get, get to the constellation. Um, so uh, if we look in it just in practice, uh, uh, how do we uh, go, go about uh, taking these, these, uh, these three paradigms into, into practice? One is our satellite. So our satellite design now it depends a bit, you know, how much you have been working in space industry. But but uh, as far as imaging radars go, this is uh, this is orders of magnitude both smaller in mass and in cost than than the than the the, uh, the satellites that currently are orbiting in space from the sort of governmental side uh, taking radar images uh, and. Uh, if you were looking at the, uh, the, the uh, recent, uh, for instance, the SpaceX launch of, of, of the, the first Starlink satellites, uh, the theme of flatness is, is there too. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, what you see there is, is mostly you know, just the radar antenna uh, face facing our way, and then there will be solar panels facing the other way. And uh, how, does the, how does the radar satellite work? Uh, in a way, while the satellite is, is flying, uh, flying in space uh, over a given target, then, then and what it does is, is that we sort of point it a bit sideways, and, and then, uh, you know, the, as a traditional radar, you, you get the sort of pulse, uh, pulse one-dimension uh, resolution coming from the, you know, just the traditional radar way, but then how you compress the, the uh, flight direction dimension into being, you know, just in orders of meters of resolution, is, uh, is that's where the where synthetic aperture radar comes in, where you use the Doppler frequency of the returning signals to, to uh, you know, build a compression filter, and then it becomes an image. So this image that you see there is, uh, is, is, is only you know, built uh, out of our radar. So uh, you might think that it's, it's, it's sort of very hard to analyze radar imagery, but, but you can already see you know, airports, waves, coast, fields. So uh, you're almost a radar imagery analyst, uh, you know, just after looking at this picture. Um, and, and, and secondly, the, the, the launch, so, so about the access to space. So, so, so we've taken the approach of, of, of now using literally everything that's available. So, so we've been launching from uh, India, we've been launching from America, with the, the sort of available commercial launchers. Beyond that, you know, would launch from New Zealand, Russia, Japan. Uh, so, so really, uh, there is a way to get your payload on a, a larger rocket uh, to, to be launched uh, in, in a, uh, sort of in conjunction with larger launches, and then that's where you sort of pay for the mass and, uh, and then, then get your thing launched. But sort of more and more, the industry is moving towards the direction of having these either very small dedicated launches for small satellites so that then you get your entire constellation deployed exactly to the orbits that you want in the time scales uh, that, that you want so that you are dedicated, you are uh, dictating the, the, uh, the, the, the time uh, of the launch and, uh, and, and then also going into these big multi-satellite launches where if you want to deploy a constellation of 50 satellites, you can put all of those 50 satellites into a single rocket and then get them deployed and then use propulsion on, on, on board those satellites to, to, to get them there. So this is really something that is there already and is only getting better and we are certainly taking full advantage of that. And then 
a third piece of automated analysis. Uh, we are taking this you know, very seriously and building the infrastructure uh, of, of our data operations all the way from the, you know, the way that the, the satellites are designed and then to the, you know, the rest of the infrastructure being designed in a way that you shouldn't have to be a radar imagery analyst to be able to build applications on top of this type of, uh, this type of service. So, so that the, 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 the uh, background, the, the platform allows us then to build these uh, sort of stacks. So here you see, you know, a small stack of just two images showing change detection over a port in, in Venice. Uh, so, so showing where you can see, you know, ships coming and going. There is a set of uh, oil tanks, uh, you know, full filling, and then you know, individual shipping containers uh, coming and leaving uh, the port. Um, so, so that then, then the next layer of abstraction that is built on top of this type of layer of pixels, essentially, is is then you know, set of toolkits of object detections, segmentations, change detection, and uh, something that is very specific to radar is, is uh, a tool called the interferometry, where you are dealing with the phase, so, so the, the wavelength level information uh, related to the, to, to the radar signal, so that then on top of those abstracted pieces of information, uh, you can then build applications. And, and, and this is hugely important uh, from the perspective that, that there is a, only a very limited pool of people who are both, uh, you know, business domain experts, machine learning experts, and SAR imagery experts, but, but the pool gets a bit larger when we take the SAR out of the equation already. Um, so, um, going a bit backwards, uh, sort of like, you know, how have we, you know, come to, come, come to this point uh, um, in, terms of, um, in, in, in terms of satellites and uh, Earth observation and analytics? Uh, ultimately, the story is, I mean, it's, it's just 50 years old. There, there you know, wasn't really you know, anything, any, anything before that. And, uh, and really, the uh, interesting things about now that we are you know, starting to talk about onboard processing uh, in the satellites, for instance, the, the very first imaging satellites had a very sophisticated onboard processing. It was, it was chemical onboard processing. They uh, actually developed the film uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you know, dropped, it, dropped it in a nice little container and, and you know, caught it with an airplane uh, while it was falling to the atmosphere. So, so this uh, removes the need for the ground stations for communications. For the, uh, for, for the, so the, the bandwidth was very high, actually, in uh, this one. I mean, these days, you know, every once in a while you ship hard drives, so, so this is a bit similar uh, increase of bandwidth when the, uh, when, when the uh, network didn't really allow for that. And um, the, the impact of, of, of satellites, you know, obviously was purely military in, in, in the beginning. So, so U.S. looking at Soviet Union, Soviet Union looking at, at the U.S., and the imagery was like super crude, but still already this, you know, would be something that, that gives, I mean, really shows that, well, we can see something that, you know, we just had no way of seeing before. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and sort of like, uh, you know, gives, I mean, really shows the value. This, this is user value. Uh, here is uh, uh, not artificial intelligence, but, but intelligence officers making two dots there, and this being the, the, the uh, analysis value over there. And, uh, and then really uh, what the great next phase of, of imagery, uh, there's a sort of funny anecdotes of, of then taking not just the film development, but then, uh, then you know, putting a scanner uh, that scans the film on, on board the satellite and then pushes that into a, a, a analog video signal that can be then translated to ground so that you don't have to drop the film canister, which, you know, was important, for instance, for the moon missions, because, like, you couldn't send the film canister all the way down. Uh, the satellite was there left in the lunar orbit, so this is from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, a system diagram of, uh, of, of a data pipeline, so to speak. Um, and. Uh, and then when we get to uh, sort of uh, the, the, the 90s, uh, we are talking about uh, sort of like full digital workflow. Uh, so so uh, here the, uh, uh, there is a dedicated workstation that then you know, gets that, 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 that imagery and then the analyst you know, can work around uh, the very specific data format and, and, and annotate the data uh, as it is. And nowadays, of course, you know, still majority of military intelligence work is actually being done by human analysts, of course, with uh, more and more high-resolution data available and, and, and uh, better and better uh, tools, but still the human is very strongly in, in, in the loop. And uh, ultimately, what really is the question that, that, that the sort of modern uh, analysis uh, is, is, is looking for? 
Uh, this is an uh, analysis done by a company called ImageSat International. They, they post on their Twitter feed uh, really interesting things about the world uh, quite, quite often. Uh, so so uh, these are the sort of types of things that, that you would be able to see from, I mean, not like the most spy, spy satellites, but this is even just from sort of a commercial high-resolution satellite imagery. So you're looking at, this is a North Korean nuclear program, uh, sort of like, you know, trying to understand what type of activity is going on. So this is, you know, comes to the sort of term that is, this is uh, in the intelligence world described as life patterns. So, so understanding what type of activity for instance, the cars usually do before a missile is launched. Uh, what type of pattern is there? Uh, are there only, only cars in the daytime before the, the missile is launched? Or like, you know, just before the missile is launched, does it mean that there's also a third shift in this place and there will also be more cars in the nighttime? Or, or does a specific type of crane movement in and out of a building signify that something is going to happen? And this is something that when it you know, becomes this question of pattern learning, then getting these uh, objects or computer vision problems, you know, detected out of the way and turned into something more abstract, then you can start training uh, the, the questions on, on a sort of, uh, on, on, on how the patterns lead to something. In the intelligence world, this is uh, something that is called left of launch. Uh, it's sort of an official US uh, strategy to really try and understand what happens before launch, how early can we prevent uh, or like predict uh, this this type of events and it's a really interesting you know and something that is you know very much a machine learning question even if it's not a computer vision question um, and um, now then the sort of explosion of private companies uh, in the sort of startup world uh, um, in in the field of space uh, it's it's about upstreams are really kind of like very niche technologies sensors uh, full satellites constellations. Uh, downstream, uh, both the sort of infrastructure around downlink data storage, uh, you know, sort of storage in a sort of nicely queryable way, uh, and, and, and then, you know, purely geospatial analytics companies, and, and then, 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 like, you know, uh, industry specific sort of solutions, uh, solutions companies, uh, all have emerged and, uh, and then sort of are now now finding their place in, in the market. If you want to follow up, uh, this is uh, one VC fund called Seraphim. They're publishing this every quarter. It's a very interesting look into the, uh, in, into the industry at, at, at any given time. Um, so um, as ISI, so we have really sort of, you know, started from the idea that like, let's build this core infrastructure for the, for, for, for the uh, sort of next generation being kind of like GPS, but really being able to tell you, you know, also the state of everything else than just the things that have sensors. But um, the infrastructure itself, like when you're building something truly new, it's, it's uh, you know, by itself, usually not yet a business. Uh, it's very hard to go out and, and say that, like, look, guys, we're building this, and this could have huge value for you. In the same way as, you know, Amazon started as a bookstore, even if, you know, the goal might have been to build a very, you know, robust and, and the world's best infrastructure, you know, for e-commerce on, on the background. So similarly, what ISA is doing right now, we are, we are going into the uh, initial applications that we are building ourselves to really demonstrate what the new customer value from this, uh, for, from this type of really rapid, frequent, reliable type of uh, infrastructure of, of, of knowing uh, where everything is at any given time. Uh, from, from space. And, and then from there on out, increasing the partnerships, uh, you know, towards the production solutions uh, with, with, with more and more third parties when, when we are able to sort of uh, understand what are the important pieces of, of the API that really are common between all of these applications. And, and, and then, then, because like clearly we can't be the domain expert in most of these industries, if, you know, if, 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 if even any. Um, and, and then increasing the abstraction of, of, of the data and ease of use just by you know bringing more and more toolkit layers uh, on, on top of it, so so that then it becomes more and more accessible. Um, so now a few of those applications. Um, so I think in the uh, in, in the abstract we promised some pirates. So here they are. Uh, uh, um, so all the things around maritime. Uh, you know, have been a thing that, you know, obviously have been monitored specifically from space already for, for a while because, uh, you know, you would think that um, seas are, you know, one of the areas that are sort of very large and hard to monitor by 
by, let's say, airplane or coastal or, or anything sort of like uh, uh, things that work on the spot, so to speak. So, so there are a lot of basic... So if you want to know where most of the ships in the world are, like you, there are many services that you can go to, like marinetraffic.com is this one where, where uh, ultimately, you know, what gets displayed is uh, this, this uh, ship voluntarily reported locations uh, from, from this uh, uh, beacons that the system is called AIS, Automatic Identification System. Uh, which is intended originally for, you know, sort of like collision avoidance between, between ships. But nowadays, there are coastal sensors and, 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 and satellite sensors picking up those beacon signals and then uh, pulling them into services where you can just go and, and see where most of the ships are. But now, of course, if we're talking about pirates, they may not have the beacon on, uh, which, is, uh, which is a reasonable assumption uh, because it's, you know, completely voluntary for... I mean, it's required by the law, but, but in a sense uh, that, you know, you can just as well switch your thing off if you're a pirate then you might not be respecting the law anyway. Uh, so, so then where we are combining this, this uh, radar imagery piece is, is then being able to you know, pick up also those ships that you know, might not have that beacon on. And uh, how it's a you know, uh, computer vision problem is, of course, you, know, you need to be able to detect all the ships. And, and this is a signal image of the coast of Singapore, and it has thousands of ships you know, just in that single image of... You know, uh, I think it's 30 by 50 kilometers or something like this. So, so um, clearly this becomes a question that even a single image starts to be pretty annoying for human analysts to, to tag. We have obviously you know, had human analysts tagging a lot of our pictures because we're training these models, but, so that's why we know that it's pretty annoying. Um, uh, but, uh, but then you can train models, and this is pretty uh, standard, so to speak, that like, you would have model architectures that you know, quite well work if you're just able to create that data. As, of course, yeah, the, what's the challenge for us is, is that you have to start almost from scratch creating those data sets because you know, there is no uh, image net for SAR imagery from, uh, from, from space. So, so uh, that's, that, that's the annoying piece of it. But when that's done, then, then uh, you get to do this you know, very basic baseline service where you combine detections of all ships and then detections of, uh, of, of uh, the, the ships that have their beacon on. You assume that the beacons on are going to be something that is uh, A-OK, -okay, and, and then the ones that have the beacon off is something suspicious. And uh, this is an example of, of uh, shipping activity just outside the, the uh, Argentinian e e EEZ, where uh, you would have this pattern of, of, of uh, shipping vessels you know, moving in for the day to ship uh, squid fish uh, over there and then, you know, return back uh, outside so that it would have the beacons off for the time being when they are, you know, fishing in the places where they're not supposed to be fishing. And then they would uh, come back out, out from there and put their beacons on and, uh, and then, you know, sort of would evade at least the sort of obvious detection of, of, of something being wrong. But, but um, being able to track this, so like, again, it has been possible before to take images and see that this problem exists, but now only with the sort of high frequency and high reliability type of imaging you can get to a model that allows you to not just detect that such a problem exists, but actually do something about it in a way that being able to track all these vessels that are not reporting their location. And then another thing that, you know, certainly ships might have beacons on them, but let's say oil spills from ships, they I mean, they are things that are just on, on top of the water. So, so, so uh, it's an example where imaging is necessary. So, so um, uh, radar imagery specifically is really good in detecting oil slicks on top of the water just because the, the, the oil happens to make the, the um, sea waves uh, more smooth and, and then, the, then the backscatter reflection looks very different. So, so, so uh, we can build sort of segmentations uh, out, out of imagery like this to detect oil slicks on top of the water. Uh, in this particular case, it, it was a case where that ship was actually sabotaged, so like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't intentionally uh, leaking oil, but it was uh, sort of accidentally leaking oil over there. And, and then we have built this into a, you know, a web application. I, I got myself out of actually showing a demo, you know, just for the fear of failing. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but, but anyway, so, so uh, there's an application where we can you know, pull in all the uh, AIS beacons, show you the... Um, the, the uh, uh, information about the ship, so, so the beacon contains information about the length, size, name, class, uh, potentially, you know, the port of, port of origin, port of uh, destination, uh, and, and then being able to point out the ships that, that don't have the AIS on, uh, and, and then 
hopefully do something about it. So you know, one thing that you can do about it is, is for instance, uh, you, you see a ship that looks suspicious, then you can schedule uh, higher resolution imagery being taken. Now in this case, you know, the optical imagery is not at all higher resolution than ours, but, but uh, sort of demonstrates, demonstrates the concept that, that, that sort of like what in the intelligence world is, is called tip and cue. So uh, where you can build an, a structure where effectively detection of something suspicious already triggers uh, calls for other systems to, to focus more high resolution imagery in the particular area when it's available. Uh, so that then it becomes a sort of a system of systems approach. And, uh, and then what we've been doing, something more on top of this, so like what can we know out of a ship like this, you know, just by the imagery? Because like now if this ship doesn't have the beacon on, it's not reporting its length, size, uh, type, destination or anything like this. But we can actually know quite a lot about chips like this, uh, even just by that, even just by that one image. So, so um, it turns out that there are not so many different types of chips in the world. If if you're thinking of you know large carry, you know large uh, crude tankers, uh, medium crude tankers, uh, cargo ships, uh, and uh, and and you know, from from there on out. So you can have a library of models of, of, uh, of uh, normal ship designs and, and go ahead and, and scale it. So, so now here on the right is, uh, is a, a simulated radar response from a ship that is exactly this uh, as, as a model. So if, if our best guess from, from the image, you know, just by classification is that this is a, a VLCC class uh, tanker, then we can go ahead and, you know, take that model uh, take the things that we know about the orientation of our of our spacecraft and instrument, and, and then go ahead and you know, start trying. Can we make just like a direct match of of, of uh, simulated response from, from from a ship like this into in, into the actual uh, image data? And now, of course, you know now this being machine learning uh, topic, you can imagine how much that ability of being able to simulate targets like this is going to help you in you know, doing exactly the opposite of build, building classifiers, because like now you don't have to go ahead and label all of that imagery, but you can actually create really good starting points just by simulating responses of a lot of ships of that class and then build a classifier that you know, uh, is able to, to, to detect when you start mixing in the, the uh, real imagery too. And now what else can you know about the ship? Uh, you can actually know how full it is, for instance. So, so um, being able to, again, by that sort of simulated approach, find the types of features that actually are visible uh, from the, the um, sort of um, the, the depth of, of, of how, where, where the ship is, uh, ship is uh, swimming in the, in, in the ocean. You can find uh, the sort of the shadow features and, and, and then the sort of double reflection features of, of the hull to the water. Uh, in a way that you can build models that, that, that automatically uh, can also tell you how full that tanker is. So that gives you an idea of, of what the origin or the destination might be or whether there is uh, you know, ship to ship transfers happening. So you can actually know quite a lot out of, uh, out of those ships. And, and then where we are trying to take this even further is, is basically uh, doing the sort of uh, transfer between, um, between knowing this ship geometry and then, 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 then uh, you know, taking it into sort of, again, sort of more human readable uh, uh, format of, of, of optical imagery so that now you could make these transfers between optical and radar imagery, uh, not, just, no, no, not just by fitting the geometry and, and, you know, rendering the model, but actually then, you know, taking that and, you know, training uh, sort of GAN type of, uh, GAN type of models where now you have uh, Simulated uh, all real data from both of those worlds, and you know, trying to trying to mix those together so that then then you create a more robust model and you know, just generally have more data available because you can also simulate that that, that source data. Radar imagery is, is is really nice to simulate from the perspective that because the wavelengths are so long, uh, actually you can really go you know get 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 uh, extremely accurate simulated uh, results uh, you know just by having you know, almost, you know, just models downloaded from the internet uh, uh, so that the, the accuracy of the, the uh, geometry in, in a model like this doesn't need to go to more than, say, centimeters, and, and then you're still sort of completely accurate down to the sort of wavelength uh, levels because, you know, in, in radars you're talking about uh, wavelengths of, of, the, of, of, of the, the microwave 
radiation being you know in centimeters so so which is a completely different world in the optical because in the optical you need to go to like nanometer scale models to actually fully simulate all the effects that are happening in the in the geometry um, so that about uh, ships and ships and pirates and, and, and so forth so so a few other uh, use cases where uh, really the the uh, change detection rapid revisit uh, counts and uh, and then will bring sort of value to, to, to the customers in, in a sort of like a already really short term before this is something that goes all the way to consumers or anything like this. So the two classics uh, of, uh, of, of the financial indicators that are being monitored from space right now are parking lots and, uh, and, an, and an crude oil storage uh, so, or stockpiles in, in sort of more general. So parking lots, why parking lots? Uh, it, it's a question of, of a sort of a, uh, business performance indicator that you can imagine on a sort of you know very baseline if there's a lot of cars in the parking lot of a store it's probably having a lot of customers if it has a lot of customers probably doing pretty well and then when you ag aggregate this over entire countries entire continents then then you're going to get good indicators of of how a sales or certain uh, business in particular is going to do in their next earnings call because because they are going to have higher or lower sales and then have early indicators for for the sort of uh, financial industry in uh, industry piece so uh, here it sort of goes into exactly the sort of two layers that uh, we talked about earlier in the intelligence question so it's firstly a question of, of building models that, that allow you to detect cars, or in this case, you know, you don't actually need to detect individual cars. You can just detect how full that parking lot is, you know, just to get to like a fill rate is is is, uh, is a good enough starting point for for things like this. And, and then after that, it's a, it's a question of pattern learning in a way. How does the fullness of a parking lot really translate into? I mean, if ultimately somebody's trying to trade stock on this, then how does the, you know, the fill rate of a parking lot over some period of time turn into you know, the stock price? Uh, you know, sometimes there are relations that are you know, beyond sort of controllable amount of variables, but, but sometimes uh, this is why uh, machine learning models are being applied to, 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 to that type of data to really find sometimes even sort of a unique and, uh, and unexpected, uh, unexpected relations. And, uh, the floating roof oil tanks is another is another typical one which you know has even more direct relation to to uh, uh, you know trading value uh, than than in cars on, on in in uh, front of a store is in a sense that the uh, crude oil storage is something that people directly trade this crude oil so so the supply and demand of crude oil in a given geog uh, geography is going to quite directly translate into the price and then you know having just more frequent a uh, view into to that and and sort of more normalized uh, view view into to the supply and demand is going to help a lot in a way that right now a lot of the trading is, is based on just reports coming out of these places and it doesn't necessarily even uh, the, the methods of measurement might even be different, so, so that having sort of normalized way of, of looking at all of the storage really you know, can bring huge benefits. And uh, how does this work? Uh, it works in a way that, that, that like even with, with our you know, satellite being all the way you know, hundreds of kilometers up in space, we can go down to 25-ish centimeters uh, knowledge of how high the floating roof of a given oil storage tank is by measuring a few sort of uh, you know key reflection points that just happen to happen because uh, uh, because the geometry of this tank is, is is the way it is so that you have this uh, in in internal round uh, surface where 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 the uh, double reflection from the from the internal wall shows up as a very bright point so so we can extract uh, knowledge of of the fill rate of these tanks at really surprisingly good performance and, and then then turn it into something that is you know accurate frequently reliable and uh, and, and then uh, you know go ahead and revolutionize a very i mean albeit relatively niche uh, but but you know that's a good way to show that, that there is an that there there's an application that, that that then you know extends further and uh, going away from the um, the the financial uh, theme then then a few other themes where were applications we are working on right now uh, is about natural disasters, so where the frequency becomes also a question of first response. So, so that like, how quickly can you respond to, let's say, a flood? Um, so really being able to have 
imagery uh, not you know, a day after an event happened, but let's say an hour after an event happened, and then you know, going forward from there uh, at, at all times, you know, keeping on going. So then things like establishing what was the maximum extent of a flood is possible, uh, as opposed to like if you have an image every day, once per day, then the event might come and go, so, so you wouldn't even know what the maximum extent was. And then, of course, you know, the real-time aspect of actually being able to do something about it. So, so uh, these are applications that we've been working on specifically around urban flooding. And then, you know, first this becomes, you know, a sort of large insurance corporation question. So, so uh, can a reinsurance corp uh, company save money by being able to, to uh, react to, to uh, the, the evolving situation in, in an urban flood by either uh, automatically responding to claims or paying uh, paying claims already before they are even made, and then just saving money on the sort of amount of of, of claims, uh, or, or then of course then you know doing work in in sort of actively alerting customers and and, and uh, potentially preventing some 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 damages from happening. Uh, and then we go back so, um, and then then another you know that is just around the corner again soon is is, is the hurricane season. So so so. Um, uh, the wind damage assessment is something that, this is where we go back to the uh, question of, of, of uh, techniques around interferometry where we're really measuring the sort of phase uh, level changes uh, can, can give you a good insight into whether there has been changes in the roof structure of a building or, or whether a building has you know, been tilted in an earthquake or something like this, where, where then being able to label at least on a rough basis that these are the buildings that you should you know, pay attention first, uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great, great start. And then, then you know, getting going from there uh, to use the uh, relatively spar, spar, sparse resources of, of uh, damage assessment in a, in a sort of catastrophic situation like this. Um, and, uh, and then on a sort of like even larger sort of geological scale type of events are something that, that we have sort of somewhat accidentally ended up now uh, working with, you know, just because we, we are around. Uh, so this uh, uh, Anna Krakatau eruption was something that was very big uh, just around the, the end of year. And um, it was actually the deadliest volcanic eruption of the entire century, um, up until now at least. Uh, so, so um, and, and it was a great example of, of a place where in that area it's just very, very cloudy. Every day, there is the you know the structure of, of like having sort of you know daytime rainstorm happening every day means that like really really 90% of the time it's always cloudy. So that means that the optical imagery is you know having really big trouble to, to get to be a first responder to, to, to begin with, and then 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 uh, then the constellation approach of course. Then if we can get to react to things like this in the first minutes or hours, then then actually you can you know, start creating those tsunami warnings uh, before the before the waves even hit the ground. And, uh, and this is an example of, of then another thing that is specifically radar related that, that, that you can go ahead and do these elevation models out of the imagery too. And, and then this is a tool to understand that if you know, two thirds of the volume of the, uh, of, of the, the uh, island have disappeared, then clearly it has gone somewhere and it probably has you know, uh, replaced a bit of water and, and created a thing that we should react to. So being able to have this type of information in, in really in sort of like real-time basis is, is something that hopefully could save lives in the future. Um, and then the last topic around the use case is going from sort of like understanding what's happening uh, or what has just happened, going into the field of preventing uh, uh, damages uh, from happening in the first place is, is uh, when we go into, when we go even deeper into the question of interferometry, uh, what we can do with it is, is, is go ahead and measure millimeter level changes in, in structures. So uh, all the way from hundreds of kilometers in space, uh, repeating that exact same geometry of measurement on, on, on the ground uh, every day is going to give us an opportunity to, to actually compare the phases of the signals that we are, you know, we are getting from these, from these buildings. And then that means that we are in the order of millimeters of, of changes happening on that daily basis. And, and then that means that then you can build these graphs of, of does there seem to be accelerated uh, deformation or accelerated um, subsidence in uh, either 
because of sort of geological effects or, or by, by sort of structural uh, effects. So again, this is something where uh, the, the subsidence is a question of sort of remote sensing and algorithms of detection, but, but then the pattern learning is it something that, that we are only getting into right now because we are only getting to have the first data right now of, of this type of uh, this type of rapid revisit interferometry of, 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 of cities. And now what's it going to mean? It's going to mean that, that, that for still you know, years, you may not have very good uh, automated models ar around this just because you will not have had both that data and the events to learn from. But, but this is something that then in the future uh, we, we hope that we'll be able to improve. And then just as in sort of an idea of scale, now there, uh, the, the blue picture there in, in the center, is this something that uh, uh, just shows how small point targets we are able to look at from, from the radar. So like now each of those point targets are is effectively sort of one window of, of a building. So this is the uh, big uh, hotel in Singapore, the, the uh, Marina Bay Sands Hotel. And uh, so you can see the so individual floors, individual windows. And now for each of those brighter points, we could then have a measurement of, of, of uh, how it's moving in millimeter scale. So, so like understanding, is the building tilting? Is it expanding due to thermal effects? Is it expanding and contracting during a day? These are all the types of things that, uh, you know, just from the stability of, you know, having something in space and repeating very stably every day, uh, is it something that is, you know, actually very hard to do from, from the ground just because you have you know, wind moving and, uh, and all of the other sensors uh, sort of like being tied into the same reference frame as is where, where the building is. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And uh, now um, uh, to sort of touch the, the other question that was promised in the title, uh, artificial intelligence in space specifically. Um, so um, this has to do a bit with the sort of system architectures and uh, I will not go very deep in, in these, so we you know, have to unfortunately be quite high abstraction, but, but, but really you know, just describing you know, what's happening right now in, in systems where you have imagery in orbit and, and, and then data being rely, relayed through ground stations, then processed into application and then delivered to customers. This is more or less how it looks like. So, so you have the satellite being a device whose sole job is to be tasked to take images and, and then store that raw data relating to those images, and then when it passes over a ground station, establish a point-to-point -point link, push it to uh, the ground station site. Ground station site might be, in our case, let's say, in northern Norway or, or uh, South Pole or uh, New Zealand or, or South Africa. Uh, and, and then in those computers, it would be buffered and streamed into cloud, which is AWS in, in, in our case. And, uh, and then on the cloud side, the data you know, gets decrypted and decompressed, uh, and, and then the process to, to, to make that sort of first imagery, and then analytics, and then, then a sort of service backend, and then, then push to, to the service front end. Uh, so it's you know, really a very basic structure. And, uh, and then where we want to take this in, in the future is really kind of like the other sort of where the approach you know, would start to be very similar to you know, what you see, let's say, in autonomous driving, you know, large fleets or things like this, where it's really just a question of edge and cloud. So, so uh, uh, and then what that requires is, is that right now still, you know, because the communications mega constellations aren't exactly yet there, what we are lacking is, is that uh, the, the sort of continuous connectivity to satellites in space, it sort of doesn't exist yet. It exists for, let's say, some NASA satellites. They have like, you know, relay systems, but, but on a commercial scale, uh, that infrastructure doesn't yet, yet exist, but it will exist very soon. And uh, what that means is that, that then we can build this infrastructure where we deal with the satellites, you know, being, uh, you know, in sort of IoT sense, uh, remote computers in, in, in the same network, and actually pretty powerful computers at that, uh, you know, just be, in order to be able to produce those radar signals and store those radar signals, that means that we have data processing capability of you know, like gigabytes per second on board the satellite, so, so we can do a lot 
uh, already right now, and, and you know, as the technology improves, we can do more and more. So I mean, we can have the whole GPU, TPU type of a stack you know, on, on the satellite just as well. And this means that then taking the approach of, of you know, bringing not just image processing and the application code there, but even the customer side application code all the way to the satellites uh, is, is something that, that, that certainly will happen. And we are pushing our infrastructure very much to, to, to go towards that direction. Um, and exactly as said, uh, much of, uh, much of uh, that type of an approach is, is very similar to uh, what we're seeing as, as sort of the, the, the uh, you know, large push in, in how companies with large fleets of autonomous cars are now training their networks and then sort of like being able to you know, pull in uh, more data from algorithms run uh, in, 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 in the edge, but then majority of the high throughput data processing for all these video feeds are actually being done on board and, and then just data either stored or, or even discarded uh, after that. But then if specific type of data is required, you know, in order to train models there on the cloud side, then, you know, that data can be, can be pulled in. So uh, very similar architecture over there. And, you know, a lot of these software components and even hardware components are something that we can pull directly from the auto industry. Um, and now, uh, as this the last topic, we have roughly 10 minutes to go, uh, she wanted to uh, give a few pointers uh, uh, how you can get started with uh, space data in general. Uh, because, you know, we are, uh, we are a company and we are building an infrastructure that is, you know, very much commercial and, uh, and a very high end that not all applications, you know, from the get-go require very high revisit rates uh, and then a lot of the models can be trained on, on existing free data too. So, uh, you know, I come from Europe, the company is European, so, so uh, uh, you know, I like to promote the, the uh, 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 European Copernicus program, which all of this data, that it, there are, there are um, six or so satellites right now uh, flying that the data policy is completely free and open, uh, where you can get two synthetic aperture radar satellites uh, and, and then uh, two multispectral satellites and, uh, and, and then imaging spectrometer satellites. So there's a really a variety of, of, of different types of remote sensing data from space, uh, you know, completely for free. And there are, you know, good, uh, if you can see the link there on, on, on the uh, bottom, it's, it's linking to, you know, one application that is, uh, is a good uh, sort of browser application just for all of this uh, data. It's called EO Browser. Uh, there are others too, but, but this, is, this, is, this is a good one that you can sort of, you know, just see and play around with, you know, just a bit how this data looks like and then, then see if that's something that, you know, could potentially solve any problems that you have. And, and then, obviously, uh, all of this data is being pulled into, you know, directly AWS buckets too. So, so uh, if, if, if you end up, you know, finding that, that's, okay, this is enough for me, I can solve a problem, I can build an algorithm on, on top of this, then, then uh, you know, just building it directly on cloud and having access to, you know, large stacks of, of, of information is, is it something that, that you can do actually quite, quite easily. And, uh, and there's, you know, good documentation on, on, on this stuff over there. So, so certainly worth a, worth a check. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the tooling, like these data formats, they are not, um, you know, the image doesn't come in JPEGs or anything. Like, it's, uh, a, it comes in its own format. So, so uh, you need to have a sort of a stack of tools to, to be able to work with it. For specifically the Sentinel satellite, uh, satellites, uh, there is a toolkit called Snap, uh, which allows you to, um, you know, open those data formats and then do some pre-processing steps. Uh, and then it has a set of toolkits uh, that, that you can uh, play with the data. And then, 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 you know, when you sort of like get away from the remote sensing world being, you know, the pixels, you know, got taken from the satellites and then you turn them into sort of geographic information then there's the whole world of GIS and, uh, and, and, and sort of like running analysis against other geospatial data sets. And, uh, and a good desktop tool, open source, is called QGIS. Uh, really allows you to do just about everything that, that any of the commercial software would allow you to do. And, uh, you know, just there as an example, is, this is where we are showing, you know, one of our imagery used to do a, uh, a flood mask analysis and compared to an elevation model and then deriving a, uh, deriving a uh, um, flood depth uh, information of a particular frame. And, you know, this is something that, you know, an example of sort of geospatial analytics where you're just building multiple, uh, mo bringing multiple data sources in and, and, and running them. And then 
when you need to automate all of this, uh, at least one good library to know is this GDAL, which allows you to do the transformations between certain type of uh, map projections to another type of map projections, uh, and, and then, then, then stacking this imagery, co-registering, uh, all of the things that are sort of uh, uh, geographic pixel-related things. Uh, it, it has implementations for just about every, every programming language. And, uh, and then a few pointers. For the, uh, for, for the sort of computer vision and artificial intelligence frameworks for, for uh, EO data in his space. So OpenCV is, you know, is, is just computer vision, but it's something that, 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 you know, very many applications you can get started with, with, with that one, that ultimately what you want to do first is detect some types of blobs and only then start to classify them, for instance, because majority of the image might be just black and un un uh, uninteresting. Uh, and, and then when you only find bright chips, then you want to start you know, classifying those. So that's where kind of traditional computer vision frameworks really, really help to narrow down the problem into something that is, uh, you know, so you don't have to build a convolutional neural network to deal with, I don't know, 50,000 by 50,000 pixel type of frames, for instance, which is sometimes hard. Uh, and, and then a few, uh, so, so this EOLearn, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a Python um, framework that effectively allows you to, uh, you know, pull, pull that Sentinel imagery and, and then apply, you know, the sort of basic pre-processing steps and to get into kind of like analytics-ready uh, pixels and, and then, then the sort of basic object detection and segmentation tools are sort of like embedded in, inside that framework. So it's something that like reading tutorials on, on that one is, is a good place to get started uh, on, you know, what is possible with, with relative ease and, and then, you know, start improving from there. And uh, then I was speaking about the sort of lack of, uh, of, of let's say, uh, the sort of ImageNet type uh, labeled uh, archives for, or like labeled data for, for specifically imagery from space. There is uh, at least one project called SpaceNet uh, that has a few challenges where, let's say, there would be optical imagery and, uh, and, and you know, road networks, and, and then you could then, you know, train uh, a uh, segment segmentation for, for detecting roads in, in, in imagery, for instance, or, or buildings or, or things like this. So, so uh, there are some places to get started, and, and SpaceNet, it's a, it's a good data set to, to, to get started with, and at least to, to see what's there. And, um, and uh, you know, to, to sort of conclude, uh, there's a few uh, funny pointers in, in a way that, like always, you know, if you when I get into a new field and then you don't exactly know what is it that you should do, what state of art, uh, and, uh, and then what's not. Uh, so a few things that like, you know, will get you acquainted with, with uh, pretty much the full stack is, is for instance, you know, one idea is, is you know, take, uh, you know, you know, take a GAN type of uh, architecture and you know, try to train uh, a mapping between SAR imagery to optical imagery because that's something where the labels exist very easily because both of them are, are, are mapped against uh, geographical coordinates so, so, uh, so you can get pixels to pixels and, uh, and then train a model around this. There are some papers around this and they have gotten into pretty good results so, so uh, that's, that's, a, that's a start. Then, then uh, a lot of, uh, lot of the, the segmentation around time series is uh, you know, where people nowadays use mostly this type of sparse autoencoder type of approaches uh, to, to get into segmentation. So, so uh, for instance, crop type classification is something where you can have good labeled source data of segments and, and then uh, time series of, of existing optical data, for instance. Um, and then in Kaggle, there are a few uh, nice challenges around SAR data specifically. Uh, one famous one was uh, a classification data set around ships versus icebergs, which both looked like, you know, just like bright blobs in uh, radar imagery, and then being able to detect those two from each other is something that was actually very close to our hearts, specifically if we were dealing with the ships and ice. And, uh, and, and then, you know, one, one, one thing that has to do a bit more with sort of like math and, and data science is, is that uh, in, its, um, in, its, in its heart, uh, radar imagery, you know, is, is, is complex numbers. So, so sort of like a real and imaginary part. So that that's where the phase information comes from. So, uh, and then now, if you just, you know, go and pick a, uh, an, a normal uh, um, segmentation or object detection type of uh, model architecture, then usually what you feed there is, is, you know, there's just integer numbers. And, and then the way that you would feed in specifically complex numbers uh, and how does that affect uh, the, the model architecture? That's an interesting math question. 
and uh, there's some, actually quite little public work uh, done done on that one, but you know, there are, you know, in, in different, let's say, medical fields, you know, there's been more, more work done on this one. So these are maybe, you know, some, so some ideas where, where, uh, where you can sort of, uh, you know, start poking the, the field of, of, of space data and radar data and, uh, and machine learning. And, uh, and if you do anything around this, then, you know, get in touch with me because, uh, because we are looking for, for, for more developers into our team too. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, if, 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 if this is something that, 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 that uh, you get familiar with, but it actually doesn't solve the problem that you want to solve, and then the question is that, no, I will need a uh, more rapid revisit. I, I will need, uh, I, I will need uh, something that is there all the time. Well, then it's a question of eyesight data and uh, how to work you know, with, with, with us. It is we are setting up, uh, it's not yet public, but we are setting up a developer program so, so that then you know, working directly with us you know, for an application is, is obviously something that we are very, very glad to do. So, so uh, please do get in touch. And, and then exactly the ways that you would do that is, is sort of like either having very low level access into the, to the sort of like complex data or then you know, getting to the sort of like abstracted data streams or then uh, in the even more abstracted uh, toolkit level uh, as, as, as we move forward from here. So this is uh, my intro to all of this world. Hope you were inter entertained. Thank you. <laughs>